Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome and happy spring. We're excited that you've joined this webinar focused on tips for completing a narrow cost analysis. I'm Nita Johnson with the Office of Child Care's National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance. And before we get started, we just have a few logistical items. Uh, number one, the session's being recorded. And then number two, you all are muted. And so please type your questions into the Q&A box. There's a little icon below that says Q&A. And we'll do our best to answer them as we go and then save a few minutes at the end to address questions as we can. Okay, so for our agenda, we'll start by introducing our presenters and then we'll briefly review the CCDF requirements about narrow cost analyses. Uh, we'll discuss the cost of childcare, walk through how to use the provider cost of quality calculator, which we'll call the PCQC, to support a narrow cost analysis. And then we'll talk about important next steps after your analysis. All right, the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance in partnership with the BUILD Initiative is pleased to introduce Gina Capito and Simon Workman, Prenatal to Five Fiscal Strategies. Gina and Simon will talk us through understanding the cost of childcare and using the PCQC. And I'm also happy to introduce my National TA Center colleague, Julie Ingersoll, with the National Center on Subsidy Innovation and Accountability. Julie will be walking us through CCDF requirements pertaining to the narrow cost analysis. So whether you've used the provider cost of quality calculator or not, we want you to leave this call feeling more comfortable using the PCQC to support your narrow cost analysis. And keep in mind that CCDF lead agencies can request technical assistance on any topic related to the American Rescue Plan Act funding online using the link we'll provide or by contacting their regional office or child care capacity building center TA specialist. And TA services are funded by the Office of Child Care and there is no fee for lead agencies. So I believe that um, we're going to drop a link in the chat box for those forms if you'd like to submit any TA request today, uh, and then we'll note the opportunity again at the end of the session. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Julie now to talk us through the CCDF requirements regarding the narrow cost analysis. Julie? Thank you, Nina. Greetings, everyone. My peers and friends at the Quality Center have asked me to briefly provide the framework for conducting a narrow cost analysis information that some of you may have heard in the February 3rd webinar focused on increasing subsidy payments and setting rates, including cost of care. So some of this may ring a little familiar for a few of you, I hope. As you are aware, as a part of determining the prices or costs of the child care market, lead agencies must also conduct what is termed a narrow cost analysis, which estimates and analyzes the cost of providers of delivering child care services. This analysis is accomplished at both a base level of costs, in other words, providers' costs in meeting health, safety, quality, and staffing requirements, and the costs in delivering higher quality care at each level of quality, however quality is defined by the lead agency. The analysis must identify the gaps between the cost of care and the subsidy rates, and then be considered as a part of the rate setting process. The good news, Lead agencies have a lot of flexibility in performing this analysis. When the requirement for a narrow cost analysis first came out, you may have heard this referred to as doing the back of an envelope analysis. Well, we've evolved in our understanding and efforts quite a, quite a bit since then, but one thing still remains true. You as a lead agency can determine how rigorous an analysis you conduct and from what sources you pull the data. You might use the cost information you gathered as a part of your ARP stabilization grant process. You might gather statewide data on general salaries, as salaries generally represent 70% of the cost of care, give or take. You might include specific questions on your market rate survey, or you may pull together provider fo focus groups that are representative um, of, your, of your state or territory. It's up to you and your stakeholders how you proceed. While there are no benchmarks per se for a narrow cost analysis, as there are for a market rate survey or an alternative methodology, you do need to be able to articulate what you've done 
and how it's informed or helped to justify the rates. Lead agencies aren't required to set rates based solely on cost of care, but you can't ignore cost information either. You have to set your rates informed by that information. Many of you have been engaged in this work over the last two plan cycles. Others of you may be grappling with it and meeting the requirements of your waivers. And all of you may be thinking of how to make improvements to your approach for either planned or anticipated rate increases and in addressing the requirements of, dare I say it, the fiscal year 25-27 plan cycle. As I said, there's a lot of flexibility in the approaches used to measure the gap between your provider's cost of delivering childcare and a lead agency's payment rates. We are now going to learn a great deal more about one tool that can help in that measurement. As, as Nina alluded, the Provider Cost of Quality Calculator, often referred to as the PCQC. So Nina, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and that was super helpful. It's always it's always helpful to hear you explain the CCDF requirements about a narrow cost analysis. Um, so this graphic illustrates, um, basically we, we tried to simplify this. So this graphic illustrates that CCDF lead agencies have the option to do a market rate survey or an alternative methodology. And regardless of which option they choose, they need to do a narrow cost analysis. And then in that blue box to the right, you see that cost modeling tools, including the PCQC, can help you complete an alternative methodology or a narrow cost analysis. And as you know, this webinar is focused on using the PCQC to help you do a narrow cost analysis. We're sharing this information with you now to emphasize that the PCQC can help meet your narrow cost analysis needs quickly and without too much complexity. So I get to turn it over to Simon Workman and Gina Capito now to discuss the cost of child care and the use of the provider cost of quality calculator. Gina? Hey, Nina. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Simon and I are happy to be with you this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are in the country. We are going to talk a little bit about some of the fundamentals of understanding the cost of child care, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time together with more focused on the implementation of the PCQC and then talk a little bit about one state's experience using the PCQC for their narrow cost analysis. So we're going to jump right in here on some shared understanding or making sure that we are all on the same page in doing this work. Simon and I in um, supporting states and communities to understand the cost of care do a lot of effort to ensure that folks are working from the same set of definitions of concepts. And so that's the first thing that we want to do. And this is one of the concepts I think that most folks are starting getting wrapping their heads around as Julie mentioned the narrow cost analysis is not a new idea nor is the idea of being able to do an alternative methodology so as states are exploring it you're coming to more understand the difference between something that maybe in previous times you referred to as the cost of child care really relates more to the price of child care and so I want to do a little bit of um, making sure that we all operate from the same playbook of definitions and so we, we do this just to lay it out very clearly we start with price and price really relates to that concept of the market market rate survey that we're all so familiar with and have spent many, many years doing as part of our child care system. And what price reflects is what families are actually paying or what they can actually pay or and what the market can bear. So it really is reflective of, again, the market rate survey and the price that's being charged in tuition typically to families for child care program, for child care services to uh, their young child. Cost, when we start moving to thinking about narrow cost analysis, true cost of care, alternative methodology, really reflects the actual expenses that a program incurs in order to operate. And we know in the, in the world of childcare, in, in many instances, you may say, oh, price and cost are the same thing. Unfortunately, in the world of childcare, we know they're not. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that market is broken here in a second, but I want you to hang on to that idea that the price and cost are not, not equivalent in, in the world of the childcare market. And but cost very much currently for programs relates to the idea of what they are currently bringing in as revenue, which is often very much driven by that price or tuition or the subsidy rate that they're able to access from the state, which is not always reflective of the true cost of care. True cost of care, and we know this from many years of understanding that how suppressed the compensation is for the child care workforce, for instance, um, and the ability of programs to actually invest in quality and build the capacity of their family child care or their center-based program in order to deliver high quality, those are things that play more into true costs. So really understanding the idea that if I was able to offer all of my employees 
healthcare benefits and other discretionary benefits. If I was able to compensate them at a higher, higher than minimum wage, look towards a living wage, look towards paying them for their, maybe the degrees that they come to the position with, that we're talking about increased compensation and we're talking about what it is the reality or the true cost of running the program. And so that's where we make that distinction between cost of actual expenses that are currently incurred now and what programs actually providers actually need in order to be able to continue to run successfully. And this is really a tipping point that we're hearing more and more from providers about being able to attract an assistant to their family child care home and continually losing folks because they find they earn a few more dollars down the road at a fast food place or at an Amazon call center. And so we realize this speaks much more to that concept of true cost of care because it's become a very competitive job market and folks are not able to stay in positions in childcare, even when they, that may be where their passion is and where they want to work. And so we want to be able to use modeling and understanding costs to get us to understand that true cost more because of the fact that as an industry, we are working on a faulty foundation. And so we want to talk a little bit about that too, before we move into the concepts of how we go about modeling for and understanding these things. And as I mentioned, price being tuition and then cost being so much driven by that tuition it's related to how our childcare market is broken. So this is kind of supports us in really thinking about and understanding why we need to understand cost more. And one of the most fundamental reasons for that is that families are the individuals that are paying that price or that tuition. Families are very price sensitive consumers, especially families of very young children who may be younger themselves. They may be early in their own careers. And so they may be lower wage earners. We also know that families that are qualifying for childcare subsidy are often the low income population and they're further from being able to purchase the cost of high quality childcare. So we have a situation where the concept of having a market in it of itself is not the issue, but the issue is in the individuals that are purchasing within that market, the families of young children are not able to purchase the full cost of the care that they're seeking. And so we end up with the dynamic where tuition then is driven by what families can afford. With those price sensitive consumers, if you're a family childcare and you started in your community and your whole purpose is in order to be able to serve the children and families in your community, you may know that you need to pay charge more in tuition, but you can't because the families can't cover the cost. And so there's sort of no reason to, you, you have to go with what families are able to pay. What we know and where this really starts to become sort of both sides of the coin, an issue is that in a market rate approach where survey is done on tuitions that are charged, that then informs the public subsidy that's available to programs. It really is very much a cycle then. Those places with lower income children and families that cannot purchase that full cost of care, um, even let alone high quality care, are then the same information that's feeding into the market rate survey, which is then being used to set subsidies. So setting subsidies via that market rate really embeds those failures in the system. And it really starts to also disincentivize quality because as a provider, if you know that the subsidy rate you're gonna get is tied to what a family is able to pay, using extra dollars to invest in the capacity and the quality of your program is just not an option. And so it really moves you further away from having that sort of institutionalized quality that we wanted our childcare programs. And so we know that while there is a amount that uh, we're held to to set of the market rate, a percentile that we're held to set, very few places are actually reaching that 75th percentile. And we also know that the, the concept of the 75th percentile of the market rate, again, is still based on what families are able to pay for childcare. It is not based on what that the actual cost of the care is. And so this moves us towards that opportunity with the narrow cost analysis to, to be able to understand more of cost-based approach to understanding the cost of care and how rates are set. And that's, that's sort of what we're moving ourselves to as a field is understanding that even while we also still may employ market rates in order to understand tuition that's being charged, comparing that to cost of care can help us really to make good, well-informed decisions. And that's one of the things that the narrow cost analysis supports you all in. There are several tools that exist to support thinking more along this cost-based approach. And as Nina said at the outset, we're gonna spend more time here on the first one. This is just in order to give you access to the link for the provider cost of quality calculator and a little bit of information about it. You also may be aware of other states that have moved towards building their own cost of quality spreadsheets or a cost model that then is tailored to their unique circumstances of their state and even unique 
different regional areas of the state. And so that's kind of another way to go about cost modeling. We're gonna focus on, again, that sort of easy to access and easy to utilize provider cost equality that you could turn around pretty quickly if you have not yet completed your narrow cost analysis. And so in order to do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of what is embedded in and how do you go about this process? So starting with the idea of what are some of your options? Julie mentioned at the outset in describing the regulations related to a narrow cost analysis, uh, the concept of data sources. And so we wanna talk about the idea that while well, the provider cost equality calculator exists, it is available to you to use at any time, you also have the opportunity to leverage data sources that you may already have access to, to inform the provider cost equality, the PCQC. So, and I want to talk a little bit about what some of those may be. We know that many states have done cost studies or done workforce compensation studies, and they've sort of taken the opportunity to, in a point in time, understand costs related to childcare. Those types of existing cost studies could be one of those existing data sources that you could then pull into and form using the PCQC. QC to think about that concept of a cost analysis and what does this currently look like for us. We also know that we all have access to things like the Bureau of Labor Statistics to really understand for ch certain childcare positions, what are in across regions in your state, what are the what is the compensation level, what is the salary point or the hourly point that staff are earning at. So you can use some of those sources as well. We've also worked in um, states and cities where the Department of Labor maintains some of this information. So you might be able to tap some of information from existing kind of what we refer to as extant data sources that are maintained by someone else, but that can be left leveraged into um, building out the provider cost equality data side of the, cal the calculator functions. We do know that there's also instances where your market rate survey may have um, asked some compensation questions or some cost questions of childcare providers, both centers and family childcare. And so looking back at your last market rate survey, there may be data within there that you can then pull into yeah, how you use the PCQC. And the state example that we're going to share later in the webinar is exactly that approach that they were able to leverage some data from their market rate survey in doing their narrow cost analysis. Of course, there's also the opportunity to do sort of a limited cost survey or study. I think you have to be really thoughtful about the point in time. If you are working on your narrow cost analysis now and your, your due date is just a couple months out, you just have to be thoughtful around whether or not you can do a limited study, get the results that you need, as, and then also complete the narrow cost analysis all before, before the deadline. There are some states that did that in advance of the 2021 deadline and found some success with gathering a little bit of cost data that then they could use to inform the PCQC. So we just find that you always want to start with what existing sources might be out there because they might be the exactly what you need for the, the level of doing a narrow cost analysis at this particular point in time to understand costs for your programs in your state. Let's talk a little bit about how the tool actually works or sort of what are the bones behind it before we get into looking at some of the outputs from it and how it functions. And so with that, we want to talk about this idea of cost drivers and the cost driver inputs that are available. This is part of the PCQC, but then also part of any idea of cost modeling. There's certain sort of specific cost drivers that impact the cost of providing a service. I think these all probably look pretty familiar to everyone, the concept of personnel and non-personnel, right? It relates to how we operate and run our programs. We also know, as Julie mentioned, that salary and benefits are 70% plus of how programs operate. So when we really think about our cost drivers and we're thinking about analyzing cost, one of the reasons that those data sources I mentioned, mentioned repeatedly the concept of having compensation data because it's such a big cost driver of the program. So looking for lots of sources where you may find how much things like utilities are, or supplies or equipment is not gonna take up as much of the cost of running the program as personnel is. So having sources that give you personnel and um, salary and compensation data are gonna be the most useful sources for thinking about data that can inform the cost drivers. So after that, then we certainly wanna understand whether or not there's variances regionally in the non-personnel like rent and utilities, but we also wanna then understand whether or not there may be variances in the compensation and personnel that may occur across your state as well. What you're doing then is pairing that data that you can gather with the available cost drivers to have sort of that foundation of how a cost model functions. And Simon's gonna talk a little more about how the PCQC does this. So that'll kind of bring it, bring it together for you. But then there's also some key quality cost drivers. And 
as you've spent time thinking about the narrow cost analysis and the requirements of it, of course, you're familiar with the fact that it references meeting the basic health and safety, but then it also talks about meeting quality standards within your state. And that's where thinking about how cost drivers related to different quality levels is an important consideration in taking the time to do this analysis activity. And there's some of the biggest ones really are what support us in understanding beyond meeting licensing, beyond general operations of a program, having staff and having a building or having a home that you use for delivery of childcare. These are the things that you do that are that are different levels of quality or higher levels of quality. So starting with ratio and group size, sort of the most common that you see within a QRIS system or a quality framework is that you may go from what is required under licensing for ratio and group size, and you may actually see smaller group sizes, more uh, better ratios of the number of teaching staff or caregivers to children and smaller groups of children that a given caregiver is responsible for. That right there has a cost driver, right? If you're gonna have instead of two teachers in a classroom, three teachers in a classroom, that classroom and the services to the children in that room are going to cost more because now there's three salaries instead of two salaries. And we see those things oftentimes in a quality framework and how it's implemented in a state. We also see that pretty much all quality frames or QRIS have some element of staff qualifications increasing at higher levels of quality, which ties directly in cross our fingers that ties directly to compensation. We know in the course of collecting data that kind of takes us back to that cost concept that it doesn't always relate to the real cost because we're not able to pay people the higher compensation that we want to. But we do know that when we just think about cost drivers that increasing the qualifications and of individuals has a higher cost associated with it or could have a higher cost associated with it. So it's one of those opportunities to understand increases in costs when we think about increases in qualifications. And then the, uh, the third biggest area that we see from increased quality levels as far as translating into cost drivers is time. And time can fall into a lot of different categories. So one may be professional development hours and greater numbers of professional development hours at higher levels of quality within the state frame. Those, and when we think about as a cost driver, translate into, do we have teaching staff that need to have a substitute or another teacher come into the room in order for them to go achieve those professional development hours. So kind of the, the ability to have a more robust staffing pattern so that teachers can be outside of the classroom or outside of their family childcare home in order to meet the professional development or training standards. It also translates into things like increased planning time so that the staff, family childcare home owner, teaching staff can focus on those teaching and learning activities, can focus on doing child assessments and planning for the individual care and learning of each of the children that's in their group. Those things translate into more time, more time outside of the time with the children, which can be seen as a substitute or floater than going into the facility or going into the family child care home to allow the teacher to have that sort of um, beyond what's required of regulations, but quality enhanced and more focused time on um, teaching and learning for children. These, they may relate to family engagement activities, more conferences for families, sort of anything that's beyond that idea of what regulations are, but links to the quality of the engagement with the children and families can then translate into time and can, is one of those three biggest cost drivers that are more related to quality levels. Well, these are all concepts that are that, that idea of beyond regulations. What we find is the PCQC exists as a resource tool that has built these concepts into it. And so what we're gonna to move to next is unpacking a little bit more of what these things specifically look like in the PCQC. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Simon to give us more on that. Thanks, Gina, and hi, everyone. So yeah, as Gina said, I'm gonna talk about now specifically turning to the PCQC and how we can use that to help you complete an narrow cost analysis or any kind of cost analysis, um, you know, even beyond the specific purposes of the required narrow cost analysis. So the PCQC, for those of you who haven't yet dived in and, and, and looked at it, it includes a lot of default data. And the purpose of this is that you basically have all of this default data, some of which is state specific, but it allows you to run some analysis and develop some scenarios without having to collect any additional data. However, as was discussed earlier, you are encouraged to use any data that you already have collected for your state to override some of the defaults in the PCQC. For instance, 
the, the, the tool automatically uses Bureau of Labor Statistics data on salaries. But if you have better salary data from a workforce survey or from something that you co uh, collected along with your market rate survey, you can use that data and put that data in and override that in the PCQC. <clears throat> Similarly, you know, to that question on uh, the QIS levels or different quality levels, you can use the, uh, the PCQC has sort of it's automatically set up with five different tabs for five different quality levels, which could be assigned, aligned with a QRAS if you have five levels of your QRAS or other five other quality sort of levels that you want to develop as well. And so what that means is that within the tool, you can adjust uh, a lot of those things that Gina was just talking about on the last slide. So you can modify ratios and group sizes at different quality levels. You can modify compensation at different quality levels or the amount of time that providers are spending on non-teaching activities related to quality. And what that means is then within the tool, you don't have to kind of redo the whole thing again at different quality levels. You can just, once you get to the site profile page, change the, the level that you want to run the analysis on and it will pull the data from that relevant tab related to that to that quality so you can start to see here how you could use the tool to show what does it actually cost at those different quality levels but also integrating the revenue portion of the pcqc to see what gaps if any exist between the estimated cost and the estimated revenue that's available at those different levels of quality so from the, the purposes of revenue, the PCQC includes a, a place where you can put in the subsidy rates, the, the payment rates, as well as um, the tuition rates. And on both sides, you can vary that by quality. So if you have tiered reimbursement, paying a higher subsidy rate uh, based on quality, you can integrate that into the PCQC. On the tuition side, you know, you can use your market rate survey to uh, make some assumptions around what you might be putting in at the different levels, or you can just use the same tuition level. For instance, you might decide to say at the middle point of quality is the 75th percentile on the tuition rates, and then you go up and down uh, from that. But either way, you can mix the subsidy and private pay uh, on the site profile page to really see both what that individual gap is, but also what is the gap depending on the different mix of subsidy or private pay you have in the program. The PCQC, as it's set up, gives you the results on a program-wide basis, but you can use those results to calculate that cost per child with the differentiations or age group, which allows you to do that really direct cost analysis comparison between what is the current estimated cost for a particular age group and what is the current subsidy rates that you pay or the current market rates that you found in your market rate survey and you know, do some analysis then on the gaps uh, and how those gaps look different for different programs, for different quality levels or for different ages. So we want to take a few minutes to talk about that approach of turning the results from the PCQC that are on the program wide basis into a cost per child approach. And there's really two ways to do this. The first is a sort of simple average approach. And in this way, you would take the total expenses that are shown on the revenue and expense statement, which is uh, what you can see here on the right of the screen is a, an excerpt of the revenue and expense statement, just showing you the expenses. So you can take the total expenses here, you know, just over $606,000, and then divide that by the staffed capacity. So, you know, the number of children that the program is staffed for, and that gives you your average annual cost per child in this scenario, about $8,900. And of course, you can convert that into a monthly figure, dividing it by 12, or a weekly rate, dividing it by 52. However, this approach really works best when your PCQC scenario is only including one age group or age groups with the same ratio and group size. So for instance, in the home-based scenarios, in the family childcare scenarios, this works well, because essentially a family childcare home is really one classroom. And while there are different requirements about how many children under two you can have in most states, in general, it's, it's one classroom. So, you know, the cost per child is generally this approach, total expenses divided by, um, be divided by the number of children. However, in a program in a center, for instance, where you have multiple classrooms of different ages, this average can really mask some significant differences in the cost per child 
that are impacted by, of course, the different ratios and group sizes that you have. So the other approach or the second approach would be to actually figure out how to estimate the cost per child by those specific age groups. Well, uh, a companion spreadsheet has been created by uh, the TA centers uh, that can help you do this and where you can take data from your PCQC scenarios and add some of that data to this spreadsheet. And then it has some formulas that help you figure out what share of the expenses should be allocated equally across the program, right, to all of the children in the program, and which expenses should be allocated to specific classrooms and then to the children within those classrooms to really get to that answer of what is the cost per child for each group. So really what it does is takes all those program-wide expenses. So, you know, the director, the you know, cost of the telephones, a lot of that non-personnel that is, that is really site-wide, and that gets equally divided by the children. But it's really the teaching personnel expenses that get divided by the children within the specific classroom that those, that those, um, that those teachers are, are teaching right, for, for those children in that classroom. So the spreadsheet will walk you through this and you can see here to request the spreadsheet, you can email either the, the quality center or the subsidy center uh, and they will send it to you. But, you know, the first step is you basically pull out the average operating, the, all of the operating costs that don't include the compensation, right? So what you can see here is the total center-wide costs without that compensation is about 306,000. You divide that by the number of classrooms and you get an average per classroom cost. Then the second stage is to actually estimate the classroom level personnel costs. So what you see on the screen here is you can see up in the top right there, this classroom uh, has 20 children enrolled in the class and it has one full-time teacher and 1.25 assistant teachers for a total compensation for this classroom of just over $71,000. And of course, you know, when you were doing this, you would do one of these for each of your classrooms. So this would be, you know, the three or four year olds classroom with 20 children in. If you were running this on an infant classroom with eight children in there, you would put just eight up in the, the top corner. And it would, you would see that it's the same compensation, essentially, if you still have one teacher and, and, and 1.25 assistant teachers, it would be the same compensation, but now split across eight children rather than 20, which goes to kind of the, the third step within this spreadsheet, which is taking the sort of putting it all together. So what you see here, the 147, 842 number at the top is the combination of those operating costs for the classroom plus the personnel costs for that particular classroom. And then if you divide them by the number of children in the classroom, that gives you your annual per child cost for that classroom of, you know, here in this scenario, it's about $7,300, $7,400. And so what you can do with that spreadsheet is you can put in just some of those, the, the basic numbers from the PCQC, and then you go through and for each classroom, change the number of children, if there's any change in the number of uh, classroom personnel that are in there, and it will give you that annual per child cost for the classroom, and will also automatically break it down to a monthly or a weekly amount. And so that allows you to start doing some of that direct comparison to the actual current rates or the proposed rates, which you can see here um, on uh, this next slide gives a sort of example of this. So what you see on the first uh, box up here, and all of this is based on a sort of hypothetical scenario, but informed by, uh, by sort of realistic data. You can see the gray table here is showing the simple average, you know, that I explained a few slides ago. So the simple average in this scenario is $743 a month. The average monthly payment rate in this scenario is 614. And you can do the simple math there and say the average monthly gap in this scenario is $129 a month which means that this provider is losing $129 a month on a child that they are serving where they, the only revenue they are getting is the, the payment rate. They are losing $129 compared to the average uh, estimated monthly cost from the PCQC, which is not great. But what you see when you go down to the green table is that when you break it out by age, you see actually where the biggest gaps are. So in this scenario, the infant monthly cost is actually about $1,500. 
of course, because ratios and group size, the, the group size is so much smaller. So you still have, you know, two teachers in there, but now maybe only eight children. So the monthly cost is a lot higher, but the payment rate is not that much higher. It's only $740. So the monthly gap on an infant in this scenario is $800. Whereas on the preschooler, the gap is only $60. And so what you see here is that if you just use an average cost, you can mask some of those significant differences in cost and the gap that exist for the different age groups. So, you know, the broken market that Gina talked about earlier, that is the reason that the payment rate for the infant here is so much lower than the monthly cost. Because if you're a parent of an infant, you probably can't afford $1,500 a month, right? So the, the tuition that the provider has to charge has to be lower than the cost. And the gap between tuition that, that families can afford to pay, the providers can charge and, and still you know, fill the seats in their program, and, and the actual cost is biggest for the younger children, for the infants and toddlers than it is for preschoolers. So when you're setting subsidy rates based on the market, that gap gets paid follows through, which is why you see the biggest gaps here on the monthly payment rate for infants uh, uh, compared to preschoolers. And so, you know, that's just a reason why it is worth taking that extra step that we just talked through on a, and looking at that spreadsheet, because it can really help you to see where should you be, see where are you seeing the biggest gaps and can help you inform the policy decisions that you'll be making about filling those gaps or where you're going to uh, uh, make uh, policy changes uh, a priority. I want to take a moment to talk about uh, some of the unique needs of family childcare and the unique kind of uh, pieces of family childcare when using the tool. The PCQC does include the ability to model out both centers and family childcare. You know, of course, family childcare providers are, are very different in terms of a business model from, from centers. Um, and that just really requires you to make sure that you are uh, you know, engaging family child care providers in the process, that you are understanding their specific needs in a specific way they are set up as a business. The PCQC does um, use their expenses in a different way. It, it follows the Schedule C tax uh, form that family child care providers would, would put in. So it, you know, accurately captures the shared business use of the home, etc. But the one thing that the PCQC doesn't include in there is compensation for the provider or owner. It does include compensation for any assistance or any particular staff they put in. And the reason for this is that the FCC providers really um, uh, vary in how they pay themselves. You know, they may pay themselves a salary or they may just rely on what is left over at the end of the month, um, uh, you know, which often is not very much, right? And their tax situation can vary very significantly as well. So the PCQC does not include a salary per se for the, for the provider owner, but there are ways to sort of consider what the salary is or consider the net revenue that comes out at the end of it as the sort of income for the provider. So on the center-based program, when on the center based uh, results, when you see the net revenue, that is the profit or loss for the provider, you know, after all expenses are paid. On the family childcare provider side, what you see here is the net revenue. So on this screen as the 32,000 is the income of the provider. And so when you look at that number, you have to think of that number, not as a profit, but as the actual, sorry about that, as the actual, uh, Let's go back to the slide as the actual income um, of the provider. And so one of the things then that's important to do is to put that income in context, right? And to, to consider the sufficiency or not of that income. So a couple of ways you can do this, uh, you can compare it to a director salary in a center, you can compare it to a lead teacher um, salary in a center. But one of the things that's important to do is to also account for the different number of hours that a family childcare provider operates. And so what you see in the boxes at the bottom of this slide here is firstly that net revenue that came from the, the PCQC, the 32,246, but then converting that into an hourly wage. And so what you can see here is there's two examples, what that looks like on an hourly wage based on 55 hours a week, and what that looks like based on 60 hours a week. And this is reflecting that, you know, if a family childcare provider is open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., then their owner is actually there operating 55 hours a week. 
you know, while a center might be open that time, they are likely to be staggering staff, right? And keeping staff at 40 hours a week. Um, whereas in the family child provider, because it's in their home, they will be looking after children for 55, 60 hours a week. And, you know, you could even put this at a higher amount to account for the additional work they do uh, beyond uh, when the children are there, you know, on evenings and weekends. And the, um, there are lots of studies out there that have looked at the number of hours that family childcare providers work, both with kids and without kids. So you can kind of put any number in that middle column there, you know, based on, based on the data and see the hourly wage. So that $32,000 a year net revenue actually turns into an hourly wage of, you know, $10 or $11 an hour. And, you know, to, you can put that up as a comparison to an average director salary in this, in this uh, uh, scenario of $55,000 a year or about $26 an hour, you know, based on a 40 hour week. And so then you can start to see how you're taking the family childcare results and looking to see is 32246 you know, uh, an adequate sort of net revenue to be in there? And, you know, how are you comparing that to centers? So when you're thinking about what the rate should be, what the true cost should be, you can actually be informing that based on what the salary, what the compensation should be for the family childcare providers. So one last word before we get onto a, a very specific state example on uh, how to think about quality. I mentioned earlier that the PCQC does have these separate tabs for up to five different quality levels, allowing you to modify the ratios and group size, compensation, and additional staff time for quality related activities. So in this way, you can run different scenarios to estimate their fiscal impact for providers of meeting those higher quality standards. So you can start to see what tiered reimbursement should look like, what the sufficiency or not of your current tiered reimbursement. So if you look at these two examples here, on the left is a scenario run at sort of what we're calling level one, and on the right is a higher quality level scenario. At the higher quality level, you can see that now additional benefits have been included. So if you look at that additional benefits line, it's zero on level one, it's 25,000 on the higher quality level, reflecting that in this higher quality program, they are paying maybe for health insurance or retirement benefits. You'll also see that the salary line has gone up from 350 something to 395, uh, reflecting higher salaries being paid at this higher quality level. And of course, then the mandatory benefits went up as well because they're based on a percentage. And so what you see there is the total personnel costs have now gone up about $60,000 in this scenario. What's interesting when you look at the non-personnel expenses is that the uh, there are not any particularly high, there are no higher costs on the non-personnel. There is nothing in this scenario that is a higher non-personnel cost. And in fact, actually the non-personnel costs have gone down slightly because in this higher quality level program, they have lower ratios and group sizes at this higher quality level. So the number of children in the program has actually decreased, which means that the, some of those child level costs, you see there the first line in the non-personnel has gone from 97,000 down to 95,000. But you can see there the total expenses. And you can also you know, use the revenue piece of the PCQC to then put up and see, okay, if we're paying a higher payment rate at those higher quality levels, is that a sufficient enough higher payment rate to cover those higher costs of care? You know, a hugely important thing is if you are uh, putting out higher standards and higher requirements of quality, are providers able to cover those higher costs with the revenues that they can uh, receive either from the payment rate or from tuition? And the PCQC can help you uh, put a put a uh, you know a number to that, not just any gaps at the base level, but at each of the tiers of quality as well. And so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Gina now to talk about a particular state example of using the PCQC for this in practice. All right, so let's talk about Maryland. They use the PCQC as part of their narrow cost analysis, and I know that they're not the only state by any means, so certainly you can share your ex uh, experiences in the chat with each other uh, as well. I just wanted to highlight some of the work that, that we did with the Maryland State Department of Ed, who um, holds their child care grant and was focusing on this question of how to complete a narrow cost analysis and how they made use of the PCQC. So 
sort of a laundry list of their process and ultimately what their outputs are. But I want to unpack some of these process pieces because I think that this sort of highlights um, much of what Simon and I just covered coming together in practice. So one of the first things as the um, support person, as the, their fiscal consultant doing this for them, one of the first things that I had to do in thinking about approaching using the PCQC was to review licensing and their quality standards. I had to look at Maryland Excels, which is the name of their um, quality rating system, and then also their licensing system to really understand sort of what types of things may be cost drivers in both of those systems so that I could make sure that what was informing the PCQC was accurate and then see if there were places that they, we needed to vary how we did the input as far as higher levels of um, anything cost driver and licensing, anything cost driver in their QRIS. They are an example of a state that actually has some salary data collected from both family child care settings and centers through their market rate survey. So with a market rate survey that had um, just been updated, uh, we were able to draw upon that salary data and use that to understand and their state that has seven regions. So it had salary data that broke down across those seven regions and see that there was some differences in compensation or salary across the seven regions of the state. So that was able to be used in the PCQC in order to give them a little more than just one point of salary across the whole state of Maryland. So that, that was useful to really think about regional variations. What we found ultimately though, is there wasn't enough salary data and wasn't sort of the purpose of the salary data in the market rate survey to understand whether there were different costs of salary at higher levels of quality in the quality rating and improvement system. Yet, similar to the examples that we've shared, their QRIS is one where qualifications are do increase at higher at, at um, higher levels of the QRIS. And so we made a judgment call and through partnership with the Maryland State Department of Ed staff, really talked about the idea that compensation should go up at those levels uh, in the QRIS, that if qualifications that are requested or required at higher levels of quality in the QRIS um, do increase, then compensation should increase too. So the salary data that came from that existing data source reflected salaries for the base level in the PCQC, and then we increased compensation for the teaching staff and as well as the director um, based on the fact that it's re it's requested in the QRS to meet higher levels, and we wanted to really demonstrate that there is an increased cost with higher levels of care if you're asking for higher qualifications. There was also some reference, and so this was the, their other major cost driver in the QRS, to staff having more time to do teaching and learning activities, planning, um, some more professional development activities. So we increased the substitute or floater time in their personnel area of the PCQC in order to cover those additional hours at the higher levels of, the, um, of their QRS in the PCQC. So those became the cost drivers, right, that were that were informing the PCQC and then the outputs that we ran. We ultimately ran all seven of the regions, which again reflected those regional compensation variations. And then we ran the um, five different quality levels in the quality rating and improvement system as well. So you can see that their outputs had that regional variation that could focus on meeting health and safety standards and the fact that there is some regional variation in cost of that. But then we also looked at what higher levels of quality cost in order to meet that other component of the narrow cost analysis. And then we compared those to the uh, currently available subsidy rates that could that you could receive for an infant toddler or preschool or school age child in order to show the cost of care compared to the available revenues for a program in the state of Maryland. And so that sort of brought together with that for them and the opportunity to sort of analyze what, what is cost of care compared to the available subsidy revenues in this instance and pulled that all together and, and made that part of their narrow cost analysis. They as a state are also really eager to think about the idea of ongoing cost modeling and how that can inform them in making some of their subsidy and policy decisions as they go forward with their system, and especially with a mixed delivery system and pre-K that's funded through the state and all those things. So moving towards a more tailored model for the state to kind of taking what they learned from the PCQC and taking it to that next level seems like a natural next step for them as well. So now they're beginning to plan on what the next few years would look like of embedding cost modeling more fully into their early care and ed system. 
And that's sort of the skinny on what Marilyn did. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nina to talk about what's next. Thank you so much, Gina. I think it's really helpful to pull together everything that we've been talking about throughout this webinar and to the example about what Marilyn did and how they use the PCQC. Um, that's great. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, so completing the narrow cost analysis is a critical first step that we've been talking you through, but what you do with the information is what's truly impactful. And uh, Simon and Gina touched on the importance of payment rates and compensation, among other things. But we do want to underline that you can use your American Rescue Plan supplemental funds to, among other things, increase payment rates for providers, increase the use of grants and contracts, and fund and support increased wages and benefits for child care providers. And as Simon illustrated earlier, identifying the gaps between subsidy rates and costs can inform those rate increases. And while you may not be able to implement some changes immediately, you can also develop a longer term strategic plan for rate increases, for example, where that gap is the greatest. You can also provide support to providers on improving their business practices. And as Simon and Gina discussed, a narrow cost analysis can help you analyze um, how increasing quality levels can impact cost. And it can provide you with information to share with policymakers and philanthropists on how much it costs to offer quality care. So not just what it costs for parents to pay for care, but what the cost of providing quality care actually is. And then also keep in mind that understanding the gaps between rates and costs can spur states to consider other policy changes that allow providers to earn or keep more money, um, such as paying providers based on enrollment rather than reducing payments if a child misses care. So lots of things to consider and lots of um, really great next steps that you can take to support the child care providers in your state. So um, we obviously encourage you to try the PCQC. We'll put a link to the PCQC in the chat box. And when you go to that link, you'll see that there's a brief video and a helpful user guide that accompany the tool. So if you have questions, you can browse to the user guide. You can also reach out to the Quality Center to ask questions. Um, and then please keep your eye out for upcoming opportunities on related topics, including a webinar on March 31st on supporting reliable subsidy revenue for child care providers while maintaining program integrity, and then other opportunities on using the PCQC, including increasing wages, improving payment policies, and increasing provider payment rates. So next, I want to draw your attention again to how you can access technical assistance um, through this link. You can do it through a form that we'll put in the chat box again. So as I mentioned before, CCDF lead agencies can request TA on any topic related to ARPA funding online using the link we'll provide or by contacting the regional office or child care capacity building center TA specialist. TA services are funded by the Office of Child Care and there is absolutely no fee to lead agencies. So um, I think that link was dropped in the chat box if you're interested. And next, I just want to highlight that there are several ACF and uh, child care TA network resources on the narrow cost analysis, as well as alternative methodologies and the cost of child care. So those links are there, and we'll be posting this, these slides and the recording on the Child Care Technical Assistance Network website. And then this is our contact info. Um, for the Quality Center, for the Subsidy Center, and for um, prenatal to five fiscal strategies. So we've got a few minutes now for questions, and we had a few come in through the chat box and the Q&A while folks were presenting. Um, so I'll pause now and talk about some of those. Um, we had a couple questions about how to access the slides and the recording, so we talked about those being posted on the website. I also want to let you know that we will send you that supplementary spreadsheet that Simon mentioned. So if you registered for this call, we'll be able to send you the spreadsheet. You can also email us if you have any questions about it. Um, and we did get a, a comment that I just want to be sure that I address. So 
while we know that you can, well, we, we talked about modeling the cost of child care using the PCQC. We want to stress that there are sort of two categories in which you can model costs. One is to map model as is scenarios. So you can model sort of those basic licensing requirements. And then another is to model like as should be cost scenarios, right? So that you're paying child care providers a living wage um, and paying them what they need to be paid. Um, and then we also got a question in the Q&A about that I can draw your attention to that I believe that Simon answered, um, which looks like a pretty lengthy response. So I'm not going to try to read the whole thing, um, but it's a great question. So I encourage you to open up the Q&A and read the question there and then look at the response. So thank you, Simon, for taking the time to do that. And I'll pause to see if any other questions came in. I don't think I'm missing any. But I just want to thank you all for your engagement during this call. Um, I want to stress again that we're here to support you through technical assistance. Um, there's a lot of great resources on the website, and we hope that you try the PCQC and that it's helpful for you. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening and a great week. Take care.